Hello. Uh, this uh, lecture will be talking about the role of culture and language in the reproduction of social inequality. Uh, it'll be kind of continuous with the previous lecture, which I used the concepts of ideology and hegemony to talk about the reproduction of inequality in the media. And it'll be in general um, continuous with uh, the past few lectures where We've talked about the reproduction of social inequality in a variety of different institutions and, and practices of social life. So I'm going to go to the uh, screen share and pull up the PowerPoint. All right. So the first thing that we're going to address is the concept of culture, uh, which turns out to be a very complicated word with uh, a long history of different uh, definitions that have changed over time. Uh, from there, we'll go to looking at instances of cultural appropriation um, as you know, it's more like modern day examples of uh, the re social reproduction of inequality in culture. Uh, we'll talk about also the concept of Orientalism, uh, which comes from a Palestinian American author named Edward Said uh, in his very influential book of the same title. And uh, from there, we'll go to looking at the role of language. Uh, we'll talk about uh, frame analysis as a tradition of sociology that associated with um, like micro sociology and symbolic interactionism. And uh, we'll also look at Pierre Bourdieu's concepts of symbolic power and symbolic violence as they relate to the relationship between language, culture, and power. Uh, and then finally, we'll be looking at instances of popular culture and the politics of representation, drawing on uh, some readings from the social inequality, the social construction of inequality and difference. Um, and that'll be, again, continuous with uh, the last week's lectures where we looked at, um, you know, instances of stereotyping and, uh, you know, racialized uh, ideologies in popular culture, going back to the minstrel show and um, in the documentary called Latinos Without Re uh, uh, Latinos Beyond Real. Okay, so um, first on to this concept of culture. Uh, examining the historical evolution of different keywords, the literary theorist Raymond Williams has concluded that culture is one of the two or three most complicated words in the English language. And the reason for that complication is that the word's definition has changed several times over the course of history. So Williams wrote this book in which he sort of traced the history of a variety of, of different keywords like culture and ideology and the masses and, you know, basically looked at the historical evolution of these words and, you know, was able to show um, that culture uh, has this, this very long history and that there have been these various kind of twists and turns in what people have meant when they talked about culture. So the oldest definition of culture, going back to the uh, early 15th century, was uh, defined as a process of growth or cultivation uh, to tend or cultivate something like crops or animals. So this is like the, the culture part in agriculture. Um, it initially meant to, to grow something, to help something uh, flourish and rise to the surface to, to cultivate. And then this was eventually extended in the 18th, by the late 18th century uh, to human development um, through art, philosophy, literature, music, theater, et cetera. So here the idea of growth or development got extended from the natural world to uh, the understanding of the human world so that now culture was defined as something that helped you grow uh, intellectually, 
spiritually, uh, politically, aesthetically, you know, um, culture was something that was good for you that helped people to develop into their highest selves. Uh, the notion, so this notion, this ideal notion of culture was linked with the upper classes and an educated elite. Um, it became synonymous with the concepts of civilized and civilization. So culture became this idea of like, you know, the um, the way that a, a English uh, critic named Matthew Arnold put it was that it was the best that had been thought and said. Um, so emphasis on, on basically the idea that only the best stuff, the best literature, theater, art, and so forth counted as culture. Um, but then with the emergence of anthropology uh, as a social science and, and getting it now into more like the mid to late 19th century, culture was redefined in a way that was connected with language, religion, rituals, and symbols, um, and other common practices of daily life. So in this definition, culture describes a particular way of life, expressing meanings and values, not just in art and educational activities, but in ordinary behavior and institutions. So culture takes on you know, all of these elements that are pictured here uh, in the um, in the, in the slide on the right side on the right side. So it incorporates, you know, religion and food and uh, music and and dress uh, and language, um, mannerisms, uh, all of these things come to be seen now as culture. And so culture is kind of redefined as something that's more ordinary as opposed to something that is, uh, uh, you know, only an, an elite, uh, only the best that has been thought and said. So this definition is non-elitist um, in the sense that culture is something that is shared by all members of a group, and some, not something that's linked to ideals of human growth or, his, or aesthetic hierarchies about the best works of art and music and so forth. And then the objects and the artifacts which represent the shared beliefs and values of a particular group, that also becomes part of this definition of culture. So the sort of things that you might find in a museum or um, a time capsule, uh, those kinds of artifacts. Now, when we talk about cultural appropriation, this is a term that you know, has gained a lot of currency, uh, especially in recent years, um, to talk about the uh, the you know unequal dimensions of cultural consumption and the way in which you know culture is like commodified and then you know becomes uh, something that can be expropriated out of its particular social context. Cultural appropriation occurs when members of a dominant group adopt cultural elements of an oppressed group in an exploitative, disrespectful, or stereotypical way, um, as we see, you know, depicted in these um, in, in these pictures at the top of the slide. Cultural appropriation often includes the exploitation of another culture's religious and cultural traditions. Uh, dance steps, fashion, symbols, language, and music. Those are the most commonly appropriated elements of culture. Um, again, you know, they're also um, commonly appropriated because they are commonly commodified um, and turned into things that are uh, for sale. Um, otherwise, there is no easy way to determine whether something is cultural appropriation. It depends on the social context and the relative power or powerlessness of the people involved. So, you know, like not all um, instances of cultural uh, borrowing can be construed as 
um, exploitative appropriation. Um, sometimes it's just like a mix, uh, a mixture, or sometimes it's uh, more like appreciation than appropriation. Where we draw that line or how we make those distinctions, there's it all depends on the social context and the especially the the relative power of the people involved and the groups that they represent. So ultimately, this comes down to a question of the relative power or powerlessness of the people involved in a particular social context. So common examples of cultural appropriation that you know we see to this day include uh, sports teams using Native American tribal names or images as mascots, um, people not from the originating culture wearing jewelry or fashion that incorporates religious symbols without any belief in the religion behind them. You know, as like we saw with, you know, people wearing like headdresses at um, Coachella or something like that. Uh, or people wearing items of deep cultural significance and status that must be earned. The phenomenon of white people adopting elements of black culture has been pre prevalent throughout US history. And I talked a little bit about this in the previous lecture when we talked about the minstrel show and how the minstrel show was um, a, you know, an act of, of stereotyping um, as well as this kind of cultural appropriation of um, music and dance and, um, you know, all kinds of uh, humor, you know, folk uh, wisdom and so forth. The minstrel shows of the 19th century can be considered the original form of cultural appropriation. In the early 20th century, cultural appropriation uh, has taken many forms. It took the form of the so-called white Negro in the jazz and swing music scenes of the 1920s and 30s. Uh, it was later seen in the zoot suitor of the 1930s and 40s, the hipster of the 1940s, the beatnik of the 1950s and 60s, the blue-eyed soul of the 1970s. Um, and in uh, hip hop, pretty much ever since, uh, since the 1980s and 90s at least. So in all these instances, you know, we find um, these uh, kind of acts of cultural appropriation, but they're especially prevalent when it comes to music, dance, and uh, style, like fashion, um, and also like slang and, and language. Uh, there's a long, long history of this in American culture. Uh, again, that that I, I would say dates back to the minstrel shows of the early 19th century, uh, as was talked about by Eric Lott in in his book Love and Theft, and and um, and and several other historical texts. Um, Edward Said theorized this phenomenon as in a, in a more like global context um, in a book that has proven to be enormously influential called Orientalism, uh, which he wrote in 1978. And here Said establishes the term Orientalism as a critical concept to describe the West's commonly contemptuous depiction and portrayal of the East, i.e., of uh, the, the so-called the Orient, um, people who inhabit the places of Asia, North Africa, and the Middle East, uh, that these places were often lumped together uh, by uh, colonists and uh, European, um, you know, uh, uh, representatives of empire into this one, uh, territory of the Orient. The term Orientalism denotes the exaggeration of difference, the presumption of Western superiority, and the application of cliched analytical models for perceiving the Oriental world. 
These cultural representations usually depict the Orient as primitive, irrational, violent, despotic, fanatic, and essentially inferior to the Westerner. And thus, enlightenment can only occur when traditional and reactionary values are replaced by contemporary and progressive ideals that are either Western or Western influenced. So here we see um, Saeed here is, is actually, this is a, a mural from San Francisco State uh, at the, uh, it's above the, the bookstore. Um, and, and I believe that Saeed, a, after this book, his next book was about um, the media coverage of Islam and the Islamic world and how distorted it was along these lines. Again, the idea that it was irrational, barbaric, violent, savage, um, and, you know, held uh, up in contrast with the Western civilized uh, progressive world. And uh, we can only imagine what Saeed, uh, if he were alive today, uh, he died in 2003, but we can just only imagine what Saeed would say today about the way that, uh, you know, people in Palestine continue to be depicted uh, in the media. So when um, talking about uh, language, you know, language is a, is a crucial element of, of, of all cultures. And, and indeed, in many cases, it's, it's the common element um, that defines a culture uh, language. And sociologists generally argue that language is not simply a medium of description and communication, but instead actively contributes to the social construction of reality. That is to say that language frames and therefore shapes reality. The words we use and the stories we tell do not passively reflect reality, but rather actively constitute it. So the, the words we use, the metaphors that we use, the jokes we tell, the analogies we make, the narratives that we uh, tell, all of these are, they matter. Uh, they matter and have an effect in the social world, not just, uh, they aren't just kind of mirrors that reflect reality, but actively constitute making reality. They are part of the making of the social world. And so language is this quite powerful. Um, language is quite powerful in the way it exerts coercion and control. Language can be used to control because it, sh it can shape a positive or a neutral or a negative reality for oneself and others. So language is closely connected to the social relationships of power and inequality and oppression that we've been talking about in this course. In sociology, frame analysis comprises a set of concepts and theoretical perspectives on how individuals, groups, and societies organize, perceive, and communicate about reality. Framing can manifest in thought or interpersonal communication. Frames and thought consist of the mental representations, interpretations, and simplifications of reality. So if we think of this metaphor of the frame, um, it talks, it, it's kind of like, you know, reality is this huge, enormous, infinite, like, canvas um, in which it's possible to see all sorts of things. And what a frame does, like a, a picture frame, is it basically 
encloses a certain part of that canvas and directs our attention to what's inside the frame, kind of puts the spotlight on what's inside the frame. And at the same time, it kind of, it, you know, excludes or marginalizes uh, everything that's outside of the frame. So it's in using these kinds of uh, mental frames that human beings are able to understand the world, to understand what otherwise would be this huge, enormous, infinite canvas of reality. And it kind of gives us a, a point of, of focus, um, a way to understand, a way to interpret uh, in what would otherwise be a confusing and chaotic situation. And so um, the idea of, of frame analysis is that, you know, yes, it does uh, limit um, to what extent we're able to see things that are outside the frame. Um, but at the same time, it's kind of like we need those frames, like human beings need some kind of a framework for understanding the world, that it is impossible to take in the entire uh, infinite canvas of reality um, without some kind of a, a frame. So in social theory, framing is a schema of interpretation, a collection of anecdotes and stereotypes that individuals rely on to understand and respond to events. In other words, people build a series of mental filters and then use these filters to make sense of the world. The choices they then make are influenced by their creation of a frame. So just like we said in the previous slide about language, these are things that these frames are not just ways to understand and interpret reality. They also in turn have an effect in shaping reality insofar as people act based on their frame of understanding uh, the way in which they have processed and interpreted, you know, all this stimuli that comes to them from the real world. Um, frame analysis was given its name originally by this sociologist named Irving Goffman, um, a very prominent and influential sociologist whose so-called dramaturgical method examined society as a kind of performative theater. Uh, Goffman, you know, was fond of quoting William Shakespeare uh, saying that, you know, all the world's a stage. And, and he looked at society as basically, um, you know, a bunch of us as, you know, all of us as kind of like actors uh, in a performative sense, you know, that we're like playing a role and we have like a script that we've inherited from society about how to play that role. And we use props, you know, in the way that like an actor would also use props to give a, um, you know, a, a convincing performance to their audience um, on the stage of social life. So Goffman, um, this was one of his last books, um, pioneered the use of frame analysis in this uh, 1974 book um, in which he theorized what he called the organization of experience. So again, the, 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 like frames are necessary for us to be able to organize our experiences, uh, to organize our um, this, this huge uh, infinite canvas of reality that we need to have some kind of a, a frame in order to make sense of it. Um, we've talked about Pierre Bourdieu on a couple of other occasions um, with regard to class inequality and um, the role of the educational system in reproducing class inequalities and uh, we looked at his theory of cultural capital and, and distinction as it pertains to taste. 
Um, here we look to his book called Language and Symbolic Power um, in thinking about language. And Bourdieu argues that language should be viewed not only as a means of communication, but also as a means of a medium of power. So again, like that, uh, th these, as Bourdieu has done with other dimensions of his uh, research and thought, um, he shows how these uh, everyday kind of occurrences of social life and practice are intimately connected with these larger relationships of power as they extend throughout society. Um, and he's especially looks at like class and, and gendered forms of power. Bourdieu coined the term symbolic violence to describe how social inequalities and hierarchies are maintained and reproduced through language and other forms of symbolic domination. Bourdieu examines how linguistic usage varies according to social hierarchies like class and gender. He opens up a new approach to the ways language is used in the domain of politics. And a good example of this um, is the way in which the passive voice is used to obfuscate, uh, to confuse uh, power relationships when, you know, it's reported like a woman was raped or there was an officer involved shooting. Um, you know, when the police shoot someone, it's often reported as a, an officer involved shooting, not that the police shot someone. So this kind of passive voice is a good instance of um, like symbolic violence in the way that, that, that language and power are intimately connected to reproduce and legitimate uh, social power and, and inequality. Uh, and basically takes the you know, the the agent or the author of the actions off the hook and just says, well, this thing happened, you know, like just, you know, like shit happens. Um, and the reality, of course, is that it's more like people do shit. Um, people in power do shit. Uh, it's, you know, workers aren't just magically laid off or tenants aren't just like you know somehow evicted um those things are done by employers and landlords and yet often media headlines or the way that stories are sort of reported um is in this kind of passive tense uh in a way that really gets the the actor uh the agent uh, off the hook when they're in a position of power, uh, particularly like a position of state power, like the government, the military, um, and especially like with the police. Um, we've definitely seen a lot of this with, um, you know, as a, as a kind of propaganda, uh, to use a term from last week, to talk about how, you know, police uh, shootings, um, are reported in the, in the media. So we want to kind of now look to some of the articles uh, from the social construction of inequality and difference in terms of um, how they depict, um, you know, stereotypical uses of uh, media and uh, also of, of cultural appropriation and uh, you know symbolic violence when it comes to um, different racial and ethnic groups uh, and how they're portrayed in the media and in advertising and in popular culture. So we look here to Deborah Merskin's uh, article on called Winnebago's Cherokees, Apaches, and Dakotas. The persistence of stereotyping of American Indians in in American advertising brands, and here Merskin examines how stereotypes of Native Americans are created and used 
in advertising to perpetuate stereotypes. These images build on longstanding assumptions about Native Americans among whites and reinforce an ideology that has resulted in many consumers failing to see this form of racism. Um, so this was, you know, this was much more commonplace in previous decades, but, you know, as we see, like, in advertisements for uh, tobacco and and things that, you know, basically continue to call on the, uh, you know, the iconography and the mythology of the, of the American West. Um, it's particularly offensive, this, this thing about like Sitting Bull, Sitting Bull would have stood up for it. Um, this is a, obviously a more current image, the Land O'Lakes butter, uh, which is talked about by, by Merskin in this article. Um, she says the Indian woman on the package is associated with youth, innocence, nature, and purity. The result is the generic Indian maiden. Uh, the qualities stereotypically associated with this beaded, buckskin, doe-eyed young woman are transferred to the company's products. The noble, savage image is include is extended to include the female stereotype here. A noble savage is a literary stock character who embodies the concept of the indigene, the outsider, the wild human. The noble savage is an other who has not been corrupted by civilization and therefore symbolizes humanity's innate goodness. So this is a, a longstanding uh, stereotype that has circulated in American literature, uh, in all kinds of uh, advertising and um, you know product marketing. Like we see here, this this idea of the noble savage um, as somebody that you know exists kind of outside of civilization in this same way that you know Edward Said talked about as Orientalism um, as kind of uh, like savage and and pre civilized. Um, for the article. Uh, that Dave Zirin writes on the Florida State Seminoles. Um, he, you know, uh, we can look at this uh, a little bit more in depth here. Uh, the U.S. colleges and, and universities once regularly named their team mascots after Native Americans. For example, Stanford's team, Stanford University's teams were called the Stanford Indians. Uh, from 1930 to in, until 1972, um, and you see here the what used to be the university's logo and and the way that the students would um, dress up for you know uh, social events and things. So 2005, since 2005, the NCAA has had formal restrictions against naming teams after Native American tribes. Um, this this is very commonplace um, in uh, various state universities and uh, across the country. Um, in his article, uh, Dave Zirin, who's a, a, a sports writer, uh, writes for the, uh, the magazine The Nation, <clears throat> examines one of the last remaining universities that continues to use a tribe as its mascot. Uh, and that is the Florida State Seminoles. And Zyron starts off the article by describing the team's, uh, the football team's game day ritual uh, in which a, a white person with face smeared with war paint rides on a horse dressed as the legendary Chief Osceola, uh, while thousands of overwhelmingly Caucasian fans with feathers in their hair do the tomahawk chop and whoop war chants, All right? So this whole desire and describes in very vivid detail um, these kind of Saturday afternoon rituals 
of the Florida State uh, football team in which, you know, you have like 100,000 people in the stands uh, and, you know, d doing these kinds of um, ritualized behavior of the, the, the tomahawk chop and the war chants and stuff like that. Now, Zyron says that people who defend Florida State Seminoles, the defenders argue that the use of the mascot is legitimate because Florida State University has an agreement with the Seminole Nation. But then Zyron looks into this a little bit further and Zyron shows that the agreement is actually with the Florida Seminole Tribal Council and not the Seminole Nation. The majority of Seminoles don't live in Florida anymore. They live in Oklahoma as a result of the Seminole Wars and the Indian Removal Act and the Trail of Tears, the, the whole kind of forced migration of native peoples out of the American South um, and into uh, tribal territories in you know the Midwest and especially in, in Oklahoma. So the Oklahoma Seminoles who form the majority of the Seminole Nation uh, actually oppose Florida State's use of the name and uh, passed a resolution to that effect in 2013. As for the Florida Seminole Tribal Council, um, what this really is, is, is the owner of a series of luxury casino hotels throughout the state of Florida, where the Seminole brand is prominently on display. For the wealthy and powerful Florida Seminole tribal leaders, the cultural elevation of the football program is part of their extremely lucrative gaming operation. Um, but the thing is, is that the gambling uh, does not benefit the vast majority of Native Americans. Uh, its wealth flows into very few hands. Uh, the reality, as we have seen in previous lectures when we talked about poverty, uh, the reality is, is that the majority of Native Americans languish in dire poverty with reservation poverty listed at around 50%. In the late in the last census, Zyron goes on in this article and examines this person um, who you see, you know, in this previous slide, the mascot of the team, uh, this Chief Osceola. The previous um, mascot was called Sammy the Seminole, and then they replaced him uh, sometime along the way. Um, when that was deemed too offensive. And so people who defend, again, this, this ritual at Florida State say that, oh, well, you know, they're, they're actually paying like historical tribute to this actual, you know, uh, figure. And so Zyron looks into this too. And he examines the, the real Chief Osceola as an example of Florida State's cultural appropriation of the Seminoles and how that grossly distorts their actual history. Um, the real Chief Osceola was a resistance fighter and a leader of the Second Seminole War in Florida against the U.S. government. So this was... <laughs> Uh, a person that, you know, was was a dedicated to, you know, fighting the U.S. government uh, on behalf of his people. Zyron quotes from the historical text, 101 Ch Changemakers, uh, which says that Osceola was became an international symbol of the Seminole Nation's refusal to surrender. He was a renowned public speaker and a fierce fighter who was also an opponent of the U.S. slave system. One of his two wives was a woman of African descent, and it was not uncommon for escaped slaves to become part of Seminole Nation. Osceola's army frustrated the entire U.S. government, five separate army generals, at a cost to the U.S. Treasury of more than $20 million dollars. 
On October 21st, 1837, Osceola met with U.S. government officials to discuss a peace treaty. When he arrived, he was captured and imprisoned. So they basically captured and imprisoned this guy uh, under, you know, a false pretenses and said that they, you know, they want to meet him to discuss a peace treaty. And uh, when he gets there, they capture and, and imprison him. So the whole sort of point here is that this is a person that was like an an enemy of the American government and somebody that like kind of fought tooth and nail against everything that they were trying to do, um, not only with, you know, uh, removing his people, um, but also in expanding the slave system across the South. And there was this... Uh, kind of coalition that happened between displaced Native Americans and uh, like runaway slaves. Um, and, you know, there is a lot of, um, you know, kind of uh, uh, like community that, that that organized in resistance to what the United States was trying to do in the 1830s, especially with um you know the removal of all sorts of native peoples and you know pushing them uh west across the mississippi river and so they in, in many cases joined forces with with runaway slaves and and other people who were um fighting against the slave system so it's it's a kind of a cruel irony that florida state you know has has sort of appropriated this this character, uh, this person. Zyron compares it to like you know, it's as if like like the South African apartheid government had you know appropriated Nelson, Nelson Mandela, and like you know had a had like a white South African in blackface um, at you know a soccer game or something as the sort of mascot of their their apartheid team. Um, so he makes that kind of comparison. Moving on to um, the second of uh, the, the three articles that I want to discuss here from the text. Um, this one about Asian American media representation um, and looking at a uh, an analysis of films and their implications for identity development. This study investigated representations of Asian Americans in U.S. films over the past 25 years. And um, the stereotype confirming representations included emasculated men, martial artists, timid women, nerdy sidekicks, characters for comedy, comedic relief, sadistic aggressors, perpetual foreigners, family-focused characters, without any other nuanced characteristics and overly strict parental figures. So these are kind of like the, the stereotypical stock characters um, that we see uh, pretty regularly circulating in uh, popular Hollywood films. While more diverse representations of Asian Americans has increased in recent years, there is still much room for improved positive stereotype resisting representations. There, as the uh, authors uh, continue, um, there arises the danger of negative social mirroring and an internalization of the stereotypical portrayals of one's own racial group. So here again, like with framing and language and culture, we have you know, an understanding of how these representations, they're not just like, you know, reflections or, or mirrors onto reality, they actually shape reality. And in some cases, shape reality in a very harmful way. Stereotypical representations can reinforce negative attitudes and behaviors from outgroup members, um, both the dominant group uh, and other minority groups towards Asian Americans. 
exposure to media representation that confirm stereotypes of Asian Americans can promote problematic intergroup behavior in the form of discrimination, microaggressions, and othering. So, you know, as we saw um, in, I have seen in recent years, especially around the COVID pandemic, um, with uh, violence, uh, in, including here in San Francisco, uh, against um, people of Asian descent, uh, these kinds of uh, representations that we see circulating in the culture can have a real harmful real world impact. Another key finding of the study was that representations of Asian characters differed greatly based on gender. So here they talk about um, Asian male stereotypes were presented in a very contrasting way, leaning towards nerdiness or extreme athleticism in the case of martial arts films. However, what remained common among these characters was their emasculate traits, which is a racial stereotype of African uh, of Asian American men that can negatively uh, affect their self-esteem and body image, which are two important aspects of identity formation. So the basic yeah, idea is that like when um, Asian men are portrayed in films, it's generally in these kind of like emasculated, less than, you know, fully masculine kind of uh, representation. And that again, that this has uh, an effect on actual, you know, young men as they're being socialized and developing their identity and developing their sense of their body image and their sense of self-esteem. You know, this, this can have a real negative impact if people, you know, internalize those representations and those stereotypes. Asian female characters, on the other hand, more frequently played the role of romantic interest, uh, i.e. the romantic object, uh, while Asian males rarely served the romantic interest role. Gendered representations were also present for female characters in the sense that results suggested a common trope of timid, soft-spoken Asian women who required the assistance of uh, or influence of a white male character in order to gain confidence. Most female characters were physically petite and their physical build conformed to the conventionally attractive slim body weight. Uh, the ages of Asian actors differed by gender such that female actors' ages were mostly skewed towards younger ages, uh, between like 10 and 30, while male actors were more evenly distributed across the wide age range. So uh, Asian female characters were more likely to be depicted as both physically uh, smaller, um, that is to say like, kind of unimposing, um, petite. And, you know, one might infer from that kind of like passive and, and dependent. Um, and also younger, right? As uh, Whereas this was less of a factor um, for Asian male characters, for Asian female characters are much more likely to be um, skewed towards uh, younger ages. Finally, uh, we want to talk about um, the stereotypes of uh, Arab peoples. And again, this um, draws from and, and kind of confirms a lot of the thesis of Edward Said's Orientalism. Uh, and, you know, the way that Said talked about the way that that the Middle East was, you know, sort of lumped in with this larger area of the Orient and um, portrayed in these kinds of ways and, and by the Western media. And so you have this article called, um, You May Know Me from Such Roles as Terrorist Number Four, 
in which this actor named John Ronson reflects on the negative stereotypes experienced by Muslim American actors in the United States. And he, he kind of draws on his own experience um, as somebody who's uh, continually typecast. He's an actor who's talking about, you know, the ways he's continually typecast in these narrow set of prescribed roles as, uh, you know, like terrorist number four. Um, stereotyping, as he says, significantly shifted significantly following the terrorist attacks after September 11th, 2001. Um, but as we'll see here in a minute, um, these stereotypes were also in place long before 9-11. And, and I would argue in, in some ways they, they, they gave Americans a, a frame, a, a pre-existing frame um, for understanding uh, 9/11 and and then how to 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 respond um, in these uh, disastrous wars that followed. Um, the documentary and and a book by the same title called Real Bad Arabs: uh, How Hollywood Vilifies a People. This uh, documentary and book kind of looked at these pre 9-11 representations, um, which analyzes how Hollywood corrupts or manipulates the image of Arabs. So this documentary analyzes 1000 films produced between 1896 uh, until up till 2000. Uh, that is, you know, before 9-11 that have films that have Arab and Muslim characters and a great majority of those 936 titles in total were negative in their portrayal. And the, the author, Jack Shaheen, argues that this image is characterized by showing Arabs as either as bandits or as a savage, um, as a nomadic race, uh, or shows uh, Arab women as shallow belly dancers serving evil, naive, and greedy, greedy uh, Arab sheiks. Um, so these, again, are the common stock characters, uh, the stereotypes that, you know, were in place uh, from the very beginning of, of Hollywood, you know, going back, you know, before, uh, before Hollywood was even the, the center of the film industry, you know, going back uh, to the earliest history of, of movies, going back to, you know, like 1896. And so in, in his overview of these, these representations, again, that, that were in place before 9-11, um, these pre-9-11 representations of Arab peoples in Hollywood movies, Shaheen Fall finds four consistent stereotypes. One, uh, the bad Arab character that is always evil and portrayed as a terrorist, causing explosions, shootings, stabbings, offenses, and uh, attacks. Uh, or secondly, the shallow or silly Arab character that is always naive, pursuing only fun, lust, and extravagance as I think we see here in the, in the slide from the movie Cannonball Run. Uh, the um, Bedouin Arab character that is remotely far from civilization and science and is often accompanied by tent and camel images. So, you know, here we have like, you know, the kind of corollary of the noble savage, um, the sort of Orientalist idea of the Arab as, uh, primitive in contrast to modern Western civilization. And then finally, the arrogant Arab character that is very nervous, repressive of women, and the farthest possible from emotions or romance. Um, so again, like there's a there's a gender dimension to these stereotypes as uh, just as we saw with the representation of uh, Asian American men and women. The film um, Aladdin 
uh, comes in for special analysis and criticism uh, from Jack Shaheen in Real Bad Arabs. He talks about this this film quite a lot. Uh, Disney's animated version of Aladdin was the highest grossing film of 1992, earning over $346 million in worldwide box office revenue. However, many people were alarmed by the film's stereotypes and generalizations about Arabs and the Middle East. Uh, one of the verses of the opening song, which is called Arabian Nights, was altered following complaints from the Arab American Anti-Discrimination Committee. The lyrics were changed in July 1993 from where they cut off your ear if they don't like your face in the original release. Uh, the subsequent line, however, it's barbaric, but hey, it's home was left intact. So even in this, you know, sort of um, the, the lyrics of the, the opening song, they conjured up these sort of old, you know, stereotypes about the barbarism and savagery and like, you know, they'll, they'll cut off your ear uh, kind of um, assumptions about uh, Arab peoples. The iconic film critic, Robert uh, Roger Ebert, you know, famous uh, Hollywood film reviewer, wrote in his 1992 review, quote, one of the one distraction during the film was its odd use of ethnic stereotypes. Most of the Arab characters have exaggerated facial characteristics, hooked noses, glowering bros, uh, brows, uh, thick lips. Uh, but Aladdin and the princess look like white American teenagers. So, you know, um, here again, we have this, you know, enormously uh, successful film, not just in the United States, but all over the world um, that's circulating these uh, stereotypes that, you know, Shaheen shows in his, in his, uh, documentary that you know had been in place for a very long time and I, and I would just add that you know now with current events you know with the the war in Gaza um, it's particularly important to remember this history and to think about you know how it continues to be kind of the frame for the way that we are looking at you know or being represented uh you know about the situation uh with palestinians um and you know the whole kind of uh, situation that's going on right now and will you know be going on for um you know as as, as far as anyone can tell unfortunately so i think that you know, it, it's it's important to keep these this this history in mind, and to to think about the ways in which uh, particular groups of people have been represented and framed in these kind of stereotypical way, in a way that kind of justifies and legitimates violence, um, and uh, that you know justifies and and legitimates. Uh, all sorts of uh, conquest and and has in the past. Okay, um, I'm going to stop the share there. And uh, with the next set of uh, classes, we're going to be moving on to thinking about social movements. Um, and so we'll be sort of taking a turn from looking at mechanisms of social reproduction to looking at uh, processes of social resistance. Um, but until next time, I will see you then. Bye.